Hi. Uh, I wasn't expecting feedback, thanks. That's the talk, everyone, we're done. Okay. Uh, welcome to Embracing the Co-op Studio Model in Indie Games, uh, featuring us. We have a different slide, there you go. Um, uh, today we're gonna just talk about uh, worker cooperatives. Show of hands, how many people know what a worker cooperative is? That is way more than I thought, so uh, that's great. Uh, at the start of this, we're going to, uh, the format of this, we're gonna give you a really very, very, very basic 101 on just what co-ops are, um, and then we're going to each share our experiences of how our co-ops came to be, how they're set up, um, kind of the ups and downs of that, and then we're gonna do some Q&A at the end. But at the beginning of this, we're just gonna dash through some really quick, like the elevator pitch of uh, what a co-op is. So. Uh, what is a worker cooperative? Uh, there's a lot of different aspects to them, but if you wanted to boil them way down to some very like core shared uh, ideas, it's a business that's owned, operated, and controlled democratically by its workers who share in the profits of their labor. You can already see how that's very different than probably a lot of the places you've worked. Um, these are businesses where um, decisions, all decisions are made democratically. People discuss <laughs> their salaries uh, and uh, work these things out uh, together. Um, there is, uh, you share in the profits of your labor, meaning that there's not some, like, there's not someone like way over your head that's sucking up kind of all the surplus value left over from your labor. You know, after you get paid, uh, you know, a lot of that money that you make goes up the chain. Uh, and worker cooperatives, uh, everyone is sharing uh, in that and discussing kind of democratically how that, uh, how that's working, how those things are dis uh, distributed, which leads to a lot of uh, co-ops having very um, egalitarian pay structures and revenue share and that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of ways of organizing worker cooperatives from very, like everyone just sits around a table <laughs> and like talks. Uh, some larger ones have more um, uh, a, uh, a structure where there are managers of certain, uh, you know, there's like boards of directors and stuff that are um, elected by the workers. Uh, involved, but it comes down to an idea of one person, one vote. So it's not like your art lead has five votes and <laughs> someone working on like environment art has like one or something when it comes to like these like larger decisions. Um, so it's just kind of this democratic um, sort of uh, setup. Um, and I think Bethany's gonna tell us a little bit about the uh, history. All right, so uh, cooperative societies have always existed. Um, it's basically just you know a group of folks working together to get through life, but worker co-ops as we recognize them uh, started more during the industrial re revolution. Um, it's mainly just started by workers who were trying to protect themselves um, either physically from like unsafe working conditions, um, their actual jobs, their skilled craftsmen that are just worried about the new machines coming in and them being replaced with unskilled laborers, and you know just your livelihoods, wages going down and you're not able to afford rent or basic necessities. Um, this was around the time when there was a, you could start to see the vast inequality between the bosses and workers and all of that expectation that it was happening. So, you know, they were just coming up with new techniques to try to get together and survive. And yeah, over the next couple of centuries, I mean, they grew and expanded all over the world. Um, they kind of are just, you know, empower workers to democratically own and run their own workplaces. Usually they have like a focus on serving their local communities because kind of what, uh, you know, regular companies can or won't do. Um, but yeah, and then often during times of large scale crises of labor and economics, there is kind of another burst of co-ops that kind of come up. And I think like today, that's what we're currently witnessing, like a growing wave of like worker organization, unionization, kind of more interest in starting co-ops, and this panel is kind of part of that. So yeah, like we're kind of in a, in a spot, I should probably get up on the mic before I start talking. We're kind of in a spot right now, just even the fact that this panel is happening is kind of like, because we're in part of this moment, right? Where there's more unionization, there's more organization kind of happening because we're in a kind of a difficult time <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, so that's cool, it's cool to like be here in this room and be like, oh, we're in one of those, one of those moments right now. Um, okay, so I talked a little bit about, I, I alluded a bit to how co-op structures are a little different uh, than your, uh, your structures you may be used to in other kinds of businesses. Now, I've created two slides and they're pretty complicated because business is complicated. They're, so just bear with me, we're gonna get through it. There's a lot of moving parts of this, okay? Okay. 
<laughs> so, I know there's multiple circles on there, so I'll try to walk you through it. Uh, this is a very, very, very basic breakdown of how this would work. Now, a boss could be a whole team of bosses, it could be shareholders, it's all these people up here who are making these decisions, right? Um, and then there's workers kind of below. Um, and your company could be really cool. You could be like, oh yeah, but like my boss, uh, we get together and talk things out. And uh, they take a lot of our opinions on board. We like to think of ourselves as a family and a community and all that kind of stuff. However, at the end of the day, your boss has that power, right? Like there are people that are not you <laughs> and not like, you don't, you don't have very much say in what your schedule is, how much you're paid, that kind of thing usually. The expectations are not being set by the workers. The expectations are being set by someone else. Um, and what worker co-ops do is kind of is upend that entire thing where there aren't bosses anymore or rather everyone's a boss or everyone's not a boss. That whole distinction kind of fades away. There are still people who do things like the administrative uh, tasks that you would associate with someone who's kind of at the top of a company, like there are tasks that still need to get done, but they're getting done by every, you know, by your fellow worker as opposed to your boss. You make decisions about hours, deadlines, uh, salaries, um, all kinds of just things. And it does, and we'll probably all talk about this a little bit in our own way, it changes the dynamic of how you work together in a way beyond, because like, like I said, a lot of companies, particularly a lot of companies in the games industry, are like, but we're just a big family here. We all have so much passion and working together. And that's great. Why not a structure that actually makes you, <laughs> you know, um, like, so, you know, a community uh, where you uh, are working together uh, and not just saying that in that, in that sort of way. Um, so why go a worker cooperative if you're kind of starting um, a, a studio or you already are one and you maybe want to migrate into doing that? Um, there's shared control and ownership of the workplace and the products of your labor, and that's a kind of a big thing. You know, there's not like one rock star like developer at the top of it, no pun intended, who is getting like a lot of the, uh, a lot of the credit for it necessarily. You can actually, as a, as a group of people, go like, yeah, we did this. We all share in this success. Um, in a way that you just simply can't in a uh, in kind of a more standard top-down uh, structure. There's greater accountability and participation. Um, there's greater accountability because you have to talk about stuff, right? Like if you're making a decision in like a healthy co-op that's running, you have to get together and talk, and you have to vote. Uh, we vote in a Slack. We each have like a little thumbs up button <laughs> and stuff, uh, or we like you know over like. Uh, you know, Google Chat or whatever, like you have to participate and you have that accountability for that reason in a way that you simply don't in a more hierarchical top-down uh, structure. Um, there's greater job security relative to top-down businesses. You are still dealing with selling games, trying to make it through, like this doesn't obviate all those problems or anything. However, you are probably making decisions that are based on you all trying to not have to lay yourselves off, basically. Um, since all the, the workers are coming together to make these decisions, you're less likely to be like, okay, well, we're done with the game. Uh, half of you leave now, yeah. um, because you just kind of can't necessarily uh, easily do that, um, which has its own ups and downs, but it's just different. Um, there's more equal share of profits because you are talking about that and negotiating that. This kind of goes without saying. Um, studies show that there's an increased quality of life at work and people are kind of more invested in it because they feel like a sense of ownership. Uh, they're not just working at a place. They are part of a thing that they are building and maintaining. And uh, there's a real sense of community um, and kind of emotional support. And uh, a lot of these things, uh, or least, like that's often the case, uh, because you are getting together and making these collective decisions and sharing responsibilities and sharing the ups and downs of that, um, kind of uh, amongst yourself. And there's, <laughs> and the last thing is, you're not depending on the benevolence of an owner or an employer for everything I just said, right? Like, you know, you could have the coolest boss ever, but like they could go and get like the rabies virus and 28 days later, like over the weekend, and then it doesn't matter how cool your boss was on Friday, they're still your boss. Uh, and you don't have to rely <laughs> on just the, the whims of one person or you know, some people up here to, uh, to make all these decisions for how your workspace will be um, and uh, kind of what you put into it and take out of it. And um, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of conversation right now um, about unionization, worker organization, all kinds of stuff, and that's awesome. And worker cooperatives fit into this 
uh, in different uh, ways. Um, we're giving power and ownership directly to workers. Um, you know, unions um, uh, exist uh, to bring workers together so that they can have a greater leverage um, versus, the pe versus the bosses, right? Um, there's that kind of inherent, like, sort of dynamic there. Um, whereas in co-ops, we're just kind of, I guess, skipping <laughs> to uh, just not having um, bosses to begin with. Uh, it, we kind of point to horizons beyond what we're told to expect as workers. I think a lot of people hear about, you know, all this, you know, unions and everything, but co-ops, and they're like, oh, like, co-ops aren't new, but they're new to a lot of people. So it's just like, oh, this, we can make new things. There might be better ways of doing this. Uh, history hasn't ended. Um, and uh, we can also stand in solidarity with other workers who are fighting uh, for power. We can, like, you know, because we have an understanding of, uh, yeah, we wanted to create less exploitative structures. We can recognize and you know, maybe like stand in solidarity with other people who are trying to create less exploitative structures in their own industries. And also, like, there are unionized co-ops. There are co-ops that work with unions. There's all kinds of interplays with how these things work together, uh, which is pretty cool. This is all just really exciting, and we're, um, you know, these things exist a lot elsewhere. In the U.S., this is like, like I was saying, this is like like lost knowledge almost just because yeah. it was so suppressed. Um, but it's building right now and it's really exciting. Um, so we each come to our worker cooperatives in very different ways. We're all very different in how we're set up and with our different assumptions and how we run things and where we're uh, from. Um, and because uh, it's just like any other kind of uh, business. And I think we're all going to share a little bit about that right now, starting with Ted from right. Pixel Papers. I didn't do the introductions for everyone. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm Scott from the Glory Society. Uh, we we, uh, uh, yeah, that's me. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ted. I'm from uh, Pixel Pushers Union 512. I'm Ian. I'm from Tailspinners. I'm Steve. I'm from Motion Twin. We made Dead Cells. And I'm Bethany. I'm also from Glory Society. Yeah. All right. Now, Ted. <laughs> All right. So, as I said, I'm from uh, Pixel Pushers Union 512, and we are a worker owned game development team. Uh, I'm the artist on the staff, and we are currently uh, working on a game called Tonight We Riot. So if you've heard of that, that's, uh, I'm the one who made all the pretty pixels. Um, anyways, so I've been, doing, I've been doing games for a long time. I got hired real young uh, into the industry, and without you know, naming names of places that I've been, um, I've been doing it almost 20 years. So I've seen you know, benefits go away, I've seen paid internships go away, I've seen uh, crunch become something that was just kind of like, it happens occasionally to something that's actually planned, which just blows my mind. Um, and so with all that in mind, after doing this for so long, you know, I, I figured there's gotta be a better way to do this. You know, and instead of looking for jobs every two to three years, and kind of like what Scott said, being at the um, whims of either shareholders or you know the top brass at any given studio, um, you know it would be interesting to try something new. And I've always been a big fan of history. And so what Scott was talking about, like the idea of a suppressed history in the United States, I started looking into different ways of doing things, and I ran across a group um, from roughly 100 years ago. It, how many people here are uh, familiar with the IWW, the Wobblies? Wow, that's really cool that I saw so many hands go up. Um, well, I was watching a documentary about the Wobblies, and it just struck a nerve. I was watching it, and I was like, this is great. The idea of workers owning you know, the means of production, the idea of working collaboratively in a democratic way to you know, achieve whatever your goals are, and there was a line, it was a quote that one of the workers said when they were uh, confronted by a, a group of hastily deputized uh, drunks where they called out and they said, who are your leaders? And they said, we're all leaders here. And I've always taken that to heart. So at Pixel Pushers, we're all leaders and no one's in control of everything except for us. And so when we vote on things, you know, even though I'm the one who kind of got the ball rolling, I get voted, I get outvoted you know, pretty routinely, which is great. It's very liberating. Um, so with that in mind, we, that's kind of what we call uh, shop democracy. So inside our shop, we are, we are democratic. We vote on major things to do with the game and uh, major things to do with the team. So we even voted on me being here today. And I'm here, so obviously that worked out. Uh, <laughs> 
But uh, it's also good because even as a small team, especially if you know if, the, if you guys are indie devs out there and you've got your small team, it's kind of good to start with like best practices going forward. And we started talking about like you know okay, so if tonight we riot is successful and we become self you know self propelled, uh, how do we want to handle things in the future? Should we grow? And you know, talking about democratic management, the idea of voting your managers into position as means to kind of separate the idea of salary and management and the idea of separating management from workers would kind of go by the wayside because if you're just voting amongst yourselves in your department and there's no salary linking you to that management position, you're probably going to be less concerned with holding on to that power than you are of being a good manager. So if someone's not a good manager and they're not comfortable with it even, it helps both sides. So you know, if someone wants to step down from management, they totally can. If they're not doing a good job, the workers can vote them out. Easy peasy. So anyways, uh, so like I said, you know, we're working on uh, Tonight We Riot, and I'm a big believer in the idea that the personal is the political. That everything about our lives cannot be separated from the context of the lives we live and the lives of other people around us. So with that in mind, I decided to make a game that was about workers' liberation and really use that as a means to propel the ideas of our studio. And it doesn't mean that like every game we're ever going to make is going to be politically motivated, but this one is kind of especially so. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, uh, it's, it's kind of like, you know, no matter what you're making, you're going to be making it based on the experiences you've had the upbringing you've had, the place where you live, and the culture and society you live in. And so with that in mind, we really wanted to push those ideas with our game. And we also think that it's a better way to develop. We have a lot of efficiency and flexibility. We, you know, there's no real taboos. There's no you know, worrying about whether or not your manager is going to handle being questioned, or your boss is going to deal with the idea of a subordinate you know, raising a hand in a meeting. Uh, everyone has a voice, but also everyone has accountability too. So there's no one who's, you know, kind of a sacred cow at the uh, company that can't be questioned or, you know, that their word is law. Um, and also on top of that, you know, it's, it's lower development costs. Now this changes from studio to studio, but with the way that we work, uh, our team, we all start with the same base salary and then depending on the game that you're working on, everybody gets an equal share of the profits from that game. So no one's making a huge, you know, hand over fist amount over anybody else in the studio. And, you know, that, that works out quite well because you're not having to pay for a C-suite of executives at the top of the company or making sure that a certain percentage of the profits go to a group of shareholders. Uh, it goes right back into the hands and pockets of the people who actually made the game. So, yeah, it kind of covers the fair distribution of profits. And, oh. And there we go, and that's pretty much it. So I'm gonna lead on over to Motion Twin with uh, Steven here. Thanks all. Thank you, that was cool. Um, so as I briefly mentioned earlier on, uh, I'm from Motion Twin, so we're based in France. Motion Twin's been around since 2001, um, functioning as a workers' cooperative since then, officially sort of legally set up as a workers' cooperative a little bit after that. Um, and we made the game Dead Cells, which hopefully some of you might have heard of. Um, so, yeah, our logo is a red star. Um, as you can see, that's our, a little screenshot of our old website, which was kind of steeped in constructivism and, and, and very much that, that mentality. Um, so just a little bit of a disclosure, I'm going to be the black sheep of this talk. Um, I wanted to, to, to talk about some of the complications of of running a workers' cooperative and some of the hard parts about being directly in confrontation or in discussion with your, with your fellow man or woman um, at all times. Um, so, you know, Motion Twin's kind of like the, the classic startup story, you know, but with communists. So um, <laughs> it was just a bunch of dudes making video games uh, together and they were like, man, this is awesome. We love making video games. And they started making money from it and they were like, hmm, okay, well, we're going to have to pay taxes because, you know, the government exists. Uh, so we need a legal structure to handle that. So they set up a company and a standard corporation in France comes with a whole bunch of implications in terms of how you actually distribute power. Someone has to be a manager. There actually has to be someone who's legally responsible and that person, well, they have their heads on the line. 
Um, and so that comes with all kinds of complications. However, in France, there's something cool called the Scope Société Coopérative d'Ouvrier de Production. So basically, a workers' cooperative in French. Um, and that actually allows you to have a, 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 an official, recognized by the state, legal structure um, that sort of perpetuates the existence of this workers' cooperative. And so we went down that path. Obviously, when I say we, not me. I was probably like 12 when they did that, but you know. Um, so it's managed to, to survive, um, and I think there's a couple, of, a couple of reasons for that. I think one of the major strong points um, of a scope is that it really pushes the bar um, in terms of uh, what we do. So because everyone has the right to have a say on absolutely everything, um, me being like the marketing and business dude, I can come and say to the game play programmer who's sitting around here somewhere that um, what he just did sucks and that I think we should change it. Um, but that, that can be uh, difficult in the sense that sometimes you can get, okay, if there's eight of us, you can have seven different opinions from every single one in the room all sort of saying, oh, we think you should do this, and you have to try and pick through all of that noise and come up with a consensus. Um, but it also definitely helps because no one feels illegitimate in saying, hey, I'm not happy about this aspect of the game. Can we do something about that? Um, so <clears throat> uh, some, of the, some of the issues that we've sort of run into um, with the structure of the SCOP is that, that there are peculiarity, peculiarities to um, the legal structure of the, of the co-op, um, which means that once money goes into the co-op, it becomes uh, the property of the co-op and of the, the, the national um, union of co-ops. So it doesn't technically belong to the workers in the co-op, it belongs to the workers in the co-op and all the potential future workers in the co-op. So that actually makes it very difficult to put money aside um, because once it goes in, it, it stays in the company. And if we take it out to spend it on a game, it has to come back. Um, and if it doesn't come back, then that can leave the workers in a little bit of a, a sticky situation as to, okay, why did you spend all this money? And it then not come back for the future workers of the co-op. And if we keep making games that keep making money, that's not a problem. It's actually a cool thing because it perpetuates the structure. But it does also make us cautious about uh, having a huge amount of reserves. Um, so. Not all fun and games. Limits to, to organizational efficiency. This, I was on really on my A game when I made that title up. Um, so at Motion Twin, there's zero hierarchy. Um, and, and, and there's three sort of fundamental pillars uh, that we talk about. So it's equal, equal pay, uh, equal say, and equal work. Okay? Um, apart from that, we're like, we're, I mean, based on that, we're all uh, entirely equal. Um, what that means is that probably we're limited in terms of how much we can grow. We will probably always stay small, maybe seven. You know, it's kind of that Amazon discussion about feeding a team off a pizza or something like that. Um, just because once you go past, you know, you go past 10, all of a sudden you need to have much more rigorous internal structures about internal communication, making sure that everyone's talking to each other. Whereas when there's eight of us, you can just like literally shoot someone with a Nerf gun and say, Oi, what do you think about this? Um, and what it means is that you have to have probably a lot more rules and a lot more systems than what you would have um, in a standard company, uh, or at least a lot more tools that allow everybody um, to, to have that accountability and to know that everyone else is doing the right thing. Um, so time, we track time quite carefully. Um, generally not because people are slacking. When you're an owner and a participant in your own company, there's lots of motivation to work. Um, the problem is that it goes too far, and quite often you have people who are coming into the office on the weekends just because they're like, man, I'm so excited about running my own company, this is awesome. And that starts to create a little bit of a culture of crunch, and so sometimes you have to be like, dude, take a step back, go home, hang out with your family, play with your dog, do whatever it is you've got to do, but don't be putting pressure on the rest of the team by working insane hours. Um, responsibility. Uh, the, my, my famous quip is that when, you know, well, it's not mine really, someone else said it, but when it's the responsibility of everybody, it's nobody's responsibility. And you see that with um, the dishes, for example. The dishes never get done. Um, and when they do, it's someone who grumpily goes in, washes all the dishes, then leaves an angry message on Slack, like, why don't you guys wash your dishes? Or something like that. So you've got to make sure that you have tools in place um, to take care of that. And for us, it's a little sign that says, wash your dishes now. And us regularly looking and making sure it's like, hey, someone leave the dishes here so that it doesn't pile up. And that can be the dishes, that can also be dealing with administrative tasks that no one wants to deal with, like, for example, if we get audited by the taxman, who has to go and sit with the taxman while he goes through three years' worth of accounts? Not me. Um, crunch, 
uh, again, when it's your company and you are responsible and you're also interested in absolutely making a game a success, then there's kind of like a, a, a mentality that happens where it's like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna get this done, let's get this finished, we're about to ship. And we don't, you know, there's, it's nothing like um, the crunch that exists in the industry, but it does happen and it's something that we have to be very vigilant about uh, because it can snowball and it can definitely lead to us all sort of feeling like at the end of a project, like, whoa, we need to take some time off. Cool thing about being in a workers' cooperative is that you can just have a discussion where we say, hey man, you guys tired? We tired? Let's have to take two weeks off and we can do that. So that's great. Um, so fatigue as well. Uh, fatigue is a big one um, because when you have seven other people coming to you and saying, we're not happy with what you're doing uh, or questioning your decisions, particularly like I felt that um, uh, particularly strongly when I first arrived because I was the only non-productive member on the, the business marketing dude, the only person who sort of specialized in that subject. And so I've got as many opinions going from people who don't care about that stuff and aren't really specialized in it coming and telling me, wait, but you should be doing this, you know? And you're like, eh, okay, and so you have to defend that. You can't just say, no, 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 I'm in charge of this. You have to defend your point of view and explain it rationally to everybody, which takes a lot of time and can be, can be tiring. Um, so we covered washing up. The other, the other one that sucks is telling people that they're fired um, or how you deal with what happens if uh, something doesn't go right. Um, so, so what does happen if it goes pear-shaped? Um, I put the little survivor icon. I don't know if you've ever seen that, that television show. It's awful, but it's a little bit like that because no one has the authority uh, to fire anybody else. So it's kind of like Game of Thrones mixed with Survivor. You have to democratically say, okay, um, we've decided, the majority, that you uh, are not pulling your weight or no longer fit into the team and you're going to be out. And that, I can tell you from experience, is awful. It stinks. Um, so some of the systems we put in place to avoid that kind of situation, uh, hiring, when, we, when we're hiring people, it's kind of like getting married, you know, it's a super big commitment. Um, we generally have people do two, six, like consecutive six month temporary contracts. Uh, so that gives us plenty of time to say, okay, this person fits in or this person doesn't fit in before we bring them in. And you know, most of the time you know in the first like two months, you're like, yeah, this, these guys are gonna be a great fit or sometimes you don't. And so we have to protect ourselves from that moment because getting rid of them is heart-wrenching. Um, so then questions about risk. So for example, Dead Cells, um, when I joined the company, I was uh, brought on to help do a switch from web to mobile. Um, we hadn't had a successful web game in years. Um, we tried mobile and didn't like it. It wasn't really what we wanted to do. We didn't have any success on mobile. And so by the time Dead Cells came along, it was kind of like, a last ditch effort. Um, and when you're part of a co-op, uh, you can do all kinds of amazing things, but some things that are kind of also insane. Uh, and we bet the farm uh, and basically said, okay, well, we're gonna make dead cells. We're gonna do something that we love doing and either we'll go out in a blaze of glory or it'll work and we won't. Um, so fortunately it worked. We're all still here, which is cool. But those kind of decisions, managing risk can have a different sort of uh, mentality when everyone's like, well, you know, we're either gonna do this or we're just gonna go do something else because this is what we love. And if you're used to a traditional sort of business structure as I was when I came in, that sort of seems like it's insane. And then inequality, like just individual difference and, and personal inequality. Some people are, uh, are leaders and loud mouths and wanna get involved in everything. Um, and some people have direct confrontational styles for discussions that are gonna sort of crush out the more introverted people. So how do you create space so that everyone who is a different type of person can express themselves? How do you give, um, how do you make sure that you can give responsibility to the people who won't put their hand right up and be like, yeah, I'm gonna do that, you know? You're gonna say, okay, well, you know, we noticed that you haven't been um, asking for these kind of roles. Is there something going on? And, and we try and sort of organize around that, but that takes time and it's a management uh, of the people that, that you're working with and everyone is sort of doing that at all times. So again, none of this is a reason not to do it. Um, it's, it's awesome fun, uh, but it does come with a whole bunch of different dynamics that you just don't have in a standard workplace. So I'm gonna hand it over right now. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ian. I'm from Tailspinners. 
Uh, I'm based in the UK uh, and was a bit surprised to be asked of this because I hadn't realised uh, how little the US seems to know about co-ops because we have really large-scale co-ops like uh, international, multinational corporations in the UK and across Europe uh, who work in this way. Um, we're, we're multinational. We have one guy in Toronto. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so we're coming at this from quite a different angle because we're not a development studio. Um, Tailspinners are a, a, a writing studio, an outsourced writing studio. Uh, we help everybody from indie to AAA, but mostly kind of indie to mid-level with story for their game in whatever form that might be. Um, uh, so we're a studio of people who all work together to do that, but that's not really what we are or what we were, uh, because we, we started as two freelancers who went, well, we seem to be visiting an awful lot of the same potential clients, why don't we team up? Um, and we thought about all of the reasons why that was a good thing, uh, and we adopted a company name and a logo, uh, and we made a website, and suddenly people started treating us differently, and the conversations that we had radically changed as individual freelancers. So uh, they stopped asking us things like, are you available, because you're a company, and clearly, therefore, you are always available. Uh, and they stopped asking for things like writing tests in a lot of, lot of cases, uh, because we have a cool logo or something, so <laughs> you can do the job. So it was very strange, and that, that set us thinking about how the whole thing holds together and, and, and about the gig economy, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But it went very well, um, uh, we expanded, we always had, we, we come up with a way to deal with the fact that we might have too much work because everybody thinks we're available all the time by having other freelancers to help us out kind of on call or for, for, for specific, if they had skills that we didn't have in-house. Um, and then we needed to grow and we thought about it and went, well, why did we get together in the first place? Well, actually, it was for mutual protection, right? So maybe we could talk to some of our freelancers and see if they want to join and be part of this. And, and that what happened. So we've grown into a group of what are really freelancers, but uh, a group of freelancers who all collaborate and cooperate and actually work together day to day. And this gave us a load of advantages, some of which we thought about up front, some of which only really uh, turned up later on. So these were our original reasons, and these were kind of the pitch also that we gave to, to our prospective freelancers to say, why don't, you, why don't you join us? Creative support is a big one. So if I'm writing something, um, I'm writing a bunch of dialogue, uh, and I could immediately then send that to the client and say, hey, here's the dialogue, what do you think? But they haven't been trained in dialogue in any way. The ability to pass it over to another of us internally and say, can you just have a look at this? Am I doing something insane here? Have I got it all wrong in some way? Do you think the client will like it? You know, is it story-wise? You're trained in story, does it hold up? And they can do that for you. And the brilliant thing is, because we've signed an NDA as a company, we can talk to anybody else in our company who has a particular set of skills or whatever it is, about that piece of work. So um, if one of us is much stronger in design and we've got a design issue and the, the person who's writing it is stronger in dialogue, they can just pass it over. If I'm banging my head against a brick wall with a story problem, I can call up anybody else in the company and say, hey, hey, here's my problem, can I explain this to you? And as normally happens, when you start doing that, you come up with a solution yourself. But because they're under the same NDA, at least you can talk to them about that. So creative support is, is a huge thing. Emotional and social support, and I can't stress strongly enough how important the emotional side of it is. As an individual freelancer, you are on your own against the world. You have nobody to help you. Possibly, you know, your, your partner at home or something like that. But it's a very lonely existence, and you're dealing potentially with a string of clients, and you might see them for a few months. So that's the, that's the social bit, right? Um, we're dealing with different people every day, and you have no kind of ongoing conversations, even about what, what movie did you see last night, any of that sort of stuff. And being able to be in a group with people who can and emotionally support you, um, uh, whether it's, I'm really struggling with this client, can somebody help me out? Whether it's, I'm writing a knee-jerk response to this client, can somebody shut me down before I press send? Um, <laughs> or any of those kind of things. It's so valuable to have other people just around you and, and feel as, uh, we've talked about family here before, and feel like that, that family. From an external point of view, uh, there are huge advantages to being a company. I've talked about the kind of, uh, just the feel of having something like a logo and a website and all the rest of it, just that professionalism. Um, but it also brings a lot of weight with it, which you don't have as an individual freelancer. So if uh, you're struggling with a client who isn't paying their bills for some reason, as an individual freelancer, you haven't got a lot of weight with that. You can threaten legal action or something like that in an email, but there is as much to think, well, you're a tiny company, you're one person on their own, how are you going to afford a lawyer? Whereas if we look like we've got more weight than that as being an organization, being a company, uh, and actually, we might have engaged a lawyer, I'll talk about that later, but an email on properly headed paper that looks like it's come from, you know, a proper company makes a, a huge difference. Um, internally, being a company is useful for a 
economies of scale, so we need an accountant. If each individual freelancer had to organise an accountant and pay them accountancy fees and uh, deal with accounting systems, uh, that, that cost, that, you know, not only does it cost money, but it costs time for each individual freelancer, but we only have to do that you know, once for all of us. Same for legal stuff, same for websites, same for PR, um, same for, for example, being here at GDC. There are two of us here at GDC. Um, if we wanted to do that uh, before, as our group of individual freelancers, all of us might have had to pay our own way to come across here to all do our, um, our kind of business dealing and actually be fighting each other for different deals and clients. And that's just pointless. Um, and it means that we can afford to stand here at GDC uh, as a group uh, between us, which works brilliantly. Um, practical support, uh, if I'm ill or something and uh, I need somebody else to answer an email or I'm busy here at GDC, then we've got people within the company who can do that. We've got people who can cover each other. Um, we've got people who can, you know, oh God, I forgot something. Could somebody mail me something from that thing back from the, the UK or whatever it happens to be? Um, so just the practical support of having other people around you is great. And, and just strength in numbers. And, and um, if you think about it from a, a freelancer point of view, you've got a list of contacts. But if we've got four, six, eight of us, that list of contacts is magnified hugely and we have all of those different relationships. And if we as a company get a contact from a particular possible client, we can go around everybody else and say, yeah, has anybody had dealings with this company before? Is there any connection? Is there any link we can make here? And often there is. And it just magnifies that, that, that strength in numbers. So we've done that for a while and it's worked very well. And we've discovered some other things and thought about it a bit, which... Uh, um, uh, which, yeah, are, are really good. So uh, the safety net is a really important thing. So how it works is we uh, do a job for a client, we get some money in, a small percentage of that goes into the company coffers to pay for things like accountants and, and that sort of thing, and the rest goes on to the, the people who actually did the work. Now, we put slightly more in the coffers than perhaps we might need to, just as a, a sort of fighting fund. And, and we came up with a use for it which we hadn't expected at all, and we should have, but we hadn't expected, which is when a client didn't pay, and suddenly, uh, an individual freelancer who was supposed to be paid by that job didn't have any money coming in that month, which is every freelancer's nightmare, really. Um, but we have this safety net, we have this fighting fund, and while we couldn't pay the whole of that fee, we could pay some of that fee to tide them over until we'd sorted out the invoicing and got the client to pay up. And uh, that we did it once for the first time and suddenly went, well, this is a thing that we should just do. We should put it in place. And you could do that as an individual freelancer. You could save, but it never really works out like that does it? And, and we've got everybody putting money into the pot, so the pot is, is commensurately bigger. So it, it just gives us that, that kind of fallback and that safety, which is something which is really valuable in, in this gig economy. Skill development is something we didn't occur, to, uh, didn't occur to us, but of course we are all different people with our different skills, areas of expertise, and we are... Uh, we have the ability to cross-train each other in that as freelancers. If I'm doing a, a, a voice direction session with somebody, one of the other people involved can be listening in, sitting in the background on Skype or however we're doing the voice direction, and they can pick up those skills. If we're doing a story workshop, we can have two or three of us in there to learn how to do story workshops. And so we're, we're cross-training each other all the time. Um, and something I should have said last uh, slide, I guess, is, is that... Um, the strength in numbers thing applies to the skills as well, right? So I might be really good at dialogue. We have Matt, who's, who's excellent at uh, archaeology and, and that sort of thing, alongside what he does. And we have somebody else who's very much into narrative design. And those skills all, all, all feed off each other and improve each other. And it means that if we go to a client, we have a much better offering, right? So we can't just say, well, yeah, I can, I can do the dialogue, but you'll need somebody else to do the narrative design. We don't have to do that. We can do the whole thing. Um, the gig economy. So uh, this was the big revelation, really, because we kicked this off at about the time it was becoming obvious that the games industry was changing, particularly amongst indies and, and mid-level, which is, it's much more like the film industry now. It is a small creative team comes up with an idea, they maybe get some funding for that idea, they hire a bunch of people on temporarily, and they get rid of them towards the end of the project. And that's happening at big studios, it's happening at, at very small studios. Uh, that's the life we're in. And that's difficult to unionize. Um, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's easy to unionize big companies, but you can see how it might work. You can see how all the, all, all the workers at a particularly large company can go, no, we're not having any of that, we're going to walk out. If I walk out as an individual freelance writer of a project, they go, goodbye, and hire somebody else. Um, so we're sort of micro-unionising uh, by, by being in this co-op together because of all of the benefits I've already talked about. I mean, things like, I need my contract checked. Well, we have a lawyer as part of the company. Things like the, the safety net, all of those, and, and things like just having that logo and that weight with the client. So um, 
I don't know how many other freelancers are out here in this room today, but I strongly, strongly recommend you think about teaming up with other people, if only for the key thing to me is that emotional safety net, is, is not being on your own and not feeling alone, and that's terribly, terribly valuable. Uh, and I'll hand that over. Back to Scott. I already talked a bunch, so I need a drink. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for talking. That was cool. Um, all right, so we just launched this like a week and a half ago publicly, which is funny because it took like forever to get going, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, Bethany and I are two thirds of the co team of two thirds of the uh, core team that made a game called Night in the Woods, and um, we uh, afterwards. Um, uh, we're working with a really fantastic artist named Ren Farron. Uh, she's not here. Uh, but we, uh, we needed to form a team f after Night in the Woods uh, for our next game. Uh, we had uh, a bit of money coming in from Night in the Woods, so we're like, okay, let's get this going. Now, what you're supposed to do is one of a couple things. You hire on some people. It's like Bethany and I are like, we started this, and then they do like magazine stories or whatever about us or something. And then and we also brought on this artist, and it was super cool or something. Or, or more likely, it's just Bethany and I working. We bring on a bunch of freelancers and contractors for like short-term things here and there, and you know, staff up and then staff down at the end of it. Um, um, and uh, so we were getting into that, but it just kind of seemed like wrong, right? Um, and uh, like Bethany and I, we've worked a bunch of jobs, a lot of service industry, and also just being kind of struggling artists for a while until we kind of fell through the side door into making video games. So we've had like a lot of like bosses over the years. Uh, we've been very aware of that dynamic uh, between being an employee and kind of being the person in charge. And um, it just didn't feel right. Something just felt like uh, about it. We're like, you know, we like Ren a lot. Why would we want to be Ren's boss? <laughs> Right, uh, her voice is as valuable as ours is. So I angsted about it pretty hard for a few months because I just didn't know what to do. Right, I was like, we need to make this thing, but I don't know how to. Do. Ah, this doesn't feel right. Um, and then uh, I heard about this whole worker cooperative thing and was just immediately like, wow, this sounds great. Um, you know, this is before we got into all the complicated part of actually doing it and everything. But if, <laughs> at least at first, I was like, this is fantastic. Um, and it took us a really long time, because uh, as I've said a couple of times, like in the US, like there aren't a lot of worker cooperatives. There's like, they're in the hundreds. They're growing now, um, but uh, it is um, like, I've been saying it's like lost knowledge. It's like when you have to like read the item descriptions in Dark Souls to get the story. It was like that, that's what it felt like sometimes, just getting little bits here and there of how to do this in the US. So it took a lot of legwork and research and um, a lot of Googling, a lot of like trying to find like local like people who were involved in co cooperative, like pro like cooperative building organizations and all that kind of stuff. Uh, talking to uh, Ted here, talking to um, our friend Salim up at Co-op in Montreal, a um, bunch of other people uh, and just getting kind of ideas. Uh, and so we began acting basically as a worker cooperative in 2018 and then we uh, it took us a while to get our legal entity because the government shut down for a while um, and we couldn't get our paperwork through and all that um, but we, then we fi we publicly legally uh, launched it uh, um, just last month um, so why did we do this uh, we, there was a history of projects that um, the Bethany and I have been in uh, I, uh, I co-founded an international indie animation um, collective called Late Night Work Club a few um, years ago. Um, Night in the Woods was very egalitarian, like we did vote, we knew there wasn't a hierarchy in that, but it was all informal. Um, and so the idea of like formalizing that, making that an actual like structure that we were really a part of and not just, oh, we like to keep it pretty uh, horizontal around here type of thing. Um, that sounded dirty. Anyway, um, <laughs> there was also, I think, um, experience also with IWW, knowing some uh, uh, IWW folks. Uh, we're in DSA, uh, Democratic Socialists of America, labor organizers there, um, and Game Workers Unite, which is the uh, worker uh, unionization, worker organization, advocacy uh, organization in the games industry that a few of us are a part of. 
Um, and also just a lot of years of bosses <laughs> it kind of made us not want to want to do this, right? Like I've had good bosses and bad bosses, but they're still bosses. And the good bosses, I would have liked them a lot better if they weren't my boss, you know? Um, and uh, so, yeah, tired is bosses and employees, but wait, I messed up this thing. It was supposed to say wired. <laughs> tired, bosses, employees, wild. <laughs> Worker owners, right? It's not like it's going to get rid of all your problems. Like as you know, Steve was talking about, there are complications that come with this. But it's not like being involved in the more in a more hierarchical like boss worker organization, like you know, thing gets rid of problems that you're going to have. Um, so other reasons why we did this. Um, there's creative benefits to working uh, like this. I've worked in a lot of creative um, you know scenarios where there was like here's your project lead, and then there's like the boss or whatever, and you're kind of just coming in every day going, all right, what are we doing today? Or like, oh no, the scope expanded over the weekend. Like, oh my god, I left on Friday and it was one thing, and I came back on Monday, it was another, and now I have to do all this work, and someone set a deadline, and I have to. There's just a lot that we can talk and plan that. It's, a, it's way harder for me to walk in and go, okay, everybody, we're doing this or something. We talk about it. Um, there's creative benefits to that um, that we've found. Um, we have kind of like, you know, um, it's not as though like we all get together and like when Ren draws something, all of us get together and vote what the cat looks like or something, you know? <laughs> um, there's a term that I heard a while ago, actually in a documentary about a, a like uh, um, construction co-op, that's a horizontal organization and vertical deployment, um, meaning that we all come together and talk and make these decisions, but at the end of the day, we all also have our lanes that we operate in. Um, and so while we can talk about things and vote on things um, and discuss things, at, we also trust each other to be able to do what we do best. Um, and it's not like you can't have creative direction. Like I'm kind of operating, again, voted on by the team as kind of a creative director kind of nudging us along in a certain direction. Um, so you can, it's not like it's a giant free-for-all, you know, there's still higher, there's still like, um, not hierarchy, but there's still organization and how you do stuff. And there's creative benefits to that because people feel empowered to talk, you know, to speak up because you have to get some consensus. You have to build consensus with each other. Um, you do have to wor look out for like personalities that just do, do dominate those spaces. That's something you really have to look out for. Um, but it tends towards there being more kind of creative collaboration uh, because as multiple people have said, you do have to talk about this stuff. Um, there's the material and organizational benefits which I've kind of gone over. Like material is, you know, we talk about where the money's going, what money we're putting into it, like how we're paying, well, who's getting paid. That kind of thing. Oh, we need to bring someone on. Okay, let's all talk about this because this isn't just like, oh, they hired someone and yeah. I walked in and there, there was someone there and now the company's like, oh, we got to lay people off because no, we talk about that stuff um, before we make those decisions. There's the interpersonal benefits of, I remember talking to Ren when we were first talking about this and she had just left a, a mobile studio that was particularly crunchy and I kind of was like, okay, so we want to do this worker cooperative thing, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, after I kind of explained it, she's like, why aren't every company, why isn't every company working this way? Uh, because it's one of those things where you suddenly realize like, oh, like once you get rid of the boss employee distinction, so many things change, right? Like, like overtime stuff, okay, we need to talk about that. Like crunch, okay, we need to talk, like, oh, do we need a deadline? Do we need to sprint through the next week to hit like an E3 demo or something? Cool, let's take a week and a half af after that. We can just talk about that. Um, that changes how you interact with each other. There's friction, there's all kinds of other stuff as you, as you come to uh, a, uh, um, an agreement or you come to consensus on something. Um, but there's not one person just telling someone else what to do. And it has all of these implications that you don't even realize when you put them into place. Like it trickles down into all these things and it, there's this toxic um, nature that you, there's this toxic dynamic that you get um, with a more hierarchical system that just kind of doesn't apply as much uh, when you're uh, working cooperatively. And it's just really personally fulfilling. Everyone feels like they own what they're doing, because they do legally own what they're doing, <laughs> you know? We, uh, have, there are three co-owners in our, in our company. We'll be staffing up to probably five by the end of it. Um, and uh, as we kind of build to a, a fuller uh, team, but we all own this. Like, we're all on paper, you know? So it's not just, like I said at the beginning, it's not just like, oh, we like to think of ourselves as a family and we all own it. It's like, no, we legally do. Um, and it's different. <laughs> and we went from like this dread to this excitement 
about how we structure like our labor and our relationships together as workers. Because like I said, it's not like it solves every problem. It's not like everything is sunny skies forever, but like it's exciting to be able to do this. It's exciting to own what you're making. It's, decide, it's exciting to, to not just, you know, oh, I work here, I'm part of this team too. It's like, no, I work together and we constitute what this is, all of us. There isn't one person doing it and then we all just work for them. It's like, no, we all work for ourselves and for each other. And that's just really different. Um, and so, the, yeah, that was, uh, that's pretty cool. I think that's why we, we like it so much. And so um, what we're gonna do now is opening it up to some Q&A. Um, there's a microphone there. I can't see it because there's lights. I think we have a few minutes left. Um, to do. Yeah, we got about 10 minutes left. So if you wanna come up, say your name, uh, where you're from, uh, and uh, uh, just uh, speak your question as the microphone. That is a long line already. Ooh. Jeez. All right. And you can ask. Good luck to you. You can ask just general <laughs> questions, or if there's anything specific from anyone. Hello, I'm Gabriela uh, from Argentina. I wanted to ask you if you know about B corporations and if you have any idea of how to apply it to a video game enterprise or whatever. Uh, you're talking about corporations in the US? Uh, no, it's like uh, B corporations, I don't know how it's said like properly in English, is Empresas B. Uh, it's like an organization that certifies you that you are um, a corporation that both helps like, uh, okay, it's kind of hard. Um, B Corps. Yeah, uh, it helps both, uh, no, uh, well, both in uh, monetary, but also helps uh, the society and the uh, and the uh, medio uh, ambiente, the environment. Uh, so uh, it's not like uh, you own um, a corporation and you make donations to to fulfill some things or avoid uh, taxes. It's it must be on your on your. I don't know. Uh, oh, I'm so wasting like, so like much time. Like a mission time. statement. Um, like yeah, you have on to, the like, organization. Part of your reason to exist is yeah, to benefit society. It must society. be. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's like the next step for like the future of enterprises. It's that. So, but it's most used in uh, physical things. So maybe you buy stuff that is. Uh, Manufactured, yeah. yeah. I don't know if someone wants to come and help me because. <laughs> uh, and you, uh, but in, in, a, in products that are not physical, I don't know how I can apply it. So, well, I, well if you don't know, it's okay. I'll, yeah, you I, can, like, look at it. I mean, I don't know of any off the top of my head, like, any um, game companies who have a, like, as part of their reason to exist, um, changing the world for the positive but I, I can see how it could happen. I mean, you could start a game company that has a purpose of creating educational content um, with the idea of, of changing. Actually, isn't there a guy on the panel doing something like that? <laughs> You're making a game that is a political statement. So, I mean, the idea is to, yeah. to influence political discourse. Yeah, that, I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to do with our game is we realized there really wasn't a game like that with the message that it had that was unabashedly uh, positive. That there wasn't like, you know, kind of a, a last minute reel in of like, both sides are just as bad. And, um, you yeah, know, so. No, um, the other thing, we, we have in the UK uh, things called CICs, community interest companies. Uh, and there are certainly games adjacent companies in there. There's things like Special Effect, um, which is trying to um, uh, give people with, uh, with disabilities access to ways to play games in different, different ways. And they're a, a sort of non-profit. Uh, um, a community interest company. Similarly, we have a, a company local to us who um, has set up a retro arcade and co-op working space for 
uh, developers to work in, and that's done as a community interest company. And it actually opens up a lot more um, things like uh, government grants, um, because the thing, if, if they're, they're giving money to you to help you improve the community. So it's actually a really interesting structure, but I've not seen it from the point of view of, uh, of game developers directly. There you go. <laughs> okay. Talk later. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, my name is Jamie. I'm an independent developer based in Phoenix. Um, my question for you all is, how do you go from already having a small studio or a small LLC to actually like biting the bullet to make this change? It seems like there's a lot of interpersonal lifting and convincing that has to happen. And as a studio that's primarily engineers, we're not terribly good at the talking to each other part. Um, <laughs> so do you have any suggestions or tips or strategies for how to drive that conversation and actually become a co-op? Uh, yeah, um, there's a lot of what we mentioned that's pretty nuts and bolts, right? Um, you know, a lot of us have some like you know, political ideals that go into this, but you kind of don't need those. You can just go, here's how this would benefit all of us. You know, there's a pretty, like, this will be, there is an efficiency <laughs> aspect to it. There is an aspect of transparency with each other, accountability where you, like, you know, we have to hash this out. You know, even if there is kind of that solitary life of the engineer, you can get together and say, okay, well, we all want to have some control over this space and what we're doing with our, with our um, company. So, you know, you can just, you know, like, the math checks out, for lack of better <laughs> words. Um, yeah. I think that you don't necessarily have to be all, like, super high-minded about it. Like, it's pretty mundane. Like, it's, this just is just a system that can work better and can avoid a lot of problems that we'd hit down the line. Um, so it's not just job security, it's just, like, things can make more sense because you're talking about them and discussing them and working them out together. Uh, and honestly, I think the most practical thing to do, we, we didn't approach it really from a political point of view, it wasn't a practical thing. And the most practical thing we did is simply write it down, is just list, if we change into this structure, what would change? Um, how, what are the benefits? What are the dangers? What are the costs? And make sure that everybody in the company understands that. And, and if you can, uh, for us, we, we really clearly saw the benefits fall out of that. Uh, and if the same is true for you, then that's the thing to do. And if it isn't true for some reason, then maybe don't do it. Well, that and like, you know, kind of what you were talking about of like getting people to talk to each other and stuff. Uh, I mean, it's all about everybody's schedules and stuff, and you don't want to get in the way of other people's work, of course, and you got to trust people in their departments to do what they're supposed to be doing, because that's a big part of, um, you know, at least my beliefs for uh, worker co-ops is, you know, trust your workers and trust yourself. Um, but, you know, if you, if you need to, you, what you, one thing is that, you know, we've done is, you know, every, uh, I think it's like pretty much every month, we kind of just, tap each other on the shoulder and say, like, you know, hey, what are you, what are you working on? Do you have any concerns? Like, you know, let's talk about the months ahead and kind of keep it succinct to, so it doesn't just ramble on and then everybody goes back to working on what they're working on. Yeah, at the risk of rambling on, um, we haven't really talked about communication in huge depth here, but communication is vital to any of these things. But it is to any company, right? If you're doing a company right, it should be all about communication. Yeah, one, one, like one of um, the big things that we're continuously talking about is how we do that. Do we do like a, a structured stand-up, you know, every day, like, you know, agile development and all that, or do we do like a once-a-week thing? Like, how do we keep in contact? And it is, you, you can't get around the human side of talking to each other, unfortunately. All right. Gracias por todos. Hi, uh, I'm Tabby. I'm an independent developer from Toronto, and um, I was just wondering, Especially, I'm a studio owner that would like to transition to having a co-op, and um, game making is a really multidisciplinary activity, so if you're starting this with just a few people and you do need to bring on people eventually who are doing a job that is not something you can do, um, or not something that's sort of in your core skill set, how do you deal with subcontracting? Do you do that, or do you staff up, or what's the process for bringing on more people, especially if you're starting with a low budget. <laughs> so one of the things that we did um, was we kind of just discussed amongst ourselves, like, what are the things that we're going to need intermittently? And 
do the people we're talking to, do they have other skills that they can bring to the table? Because with a small team like ours, um, a lot of us wear different hats. So, you know, I'll handle a lot of like the business side of things and talk to the publisher and, you know, arrange travel and stuff like that, even though I'm artist on the team. You know? But uh, it, when it comes to stuff like needing concept art or animation or stuff like that, we'll contract out. But we kind of have it in our best practices that we always make sure that, you know, no one works for free. Um, you know, we pay all of our contractors. And if we can't, if like someone comes to us and they're, you know, fees are outside of our budget, we're honest about it. And we're like, you know, say, hey, we think you're great. We love the stuff that you're doing, but it's outside of our budget and we're not going to make you, you know, <laughs> lower your prices just because you think we're fun folks to work with. So we want to make sure everyone comes out of this feeling good and feeling like their labor was worth it. Um, I think for us, like, the way I think about that kind of stuff, because this is, as someone who was a contractor for a long time, I think about this, and it's like, if we're a co-op, right, and, like, all of us together, like, open a pizza place, and we're all just going to make pizzas, what we do is make pizzas, right, and we get, we all put in our money, and we get a sh shop and an oven, and we're making this stuff, but, like, we're going to have to hire someone to paint our sign, or, like, design our menus, right. like, we don't do all that stuff. Um, or like design our furniture once we get big enough to have a nice dining room and all that. Um, so at least with us, um, there's an idea of like, yeah, what is like, what are these core skills that we, that we bring to it? We don't want to end up in a situation where we have like someone who's basically just a contractor, but they just don't have a vote and they're not on the team. Yeah, I was gonna um, say, how do you avoid the co-op becoming the bosses of the subcontractors that you're working with? I think that part of that is like, um, there are certain situations where there are like, yeah, when you like pull someone, like when you contract someone in, there is like a task and you do talk to them. There's all kinds of ways that you can actually make that a non-terrible process, which I think anyone who's, yeah. been a contra uh, who's been a contractor can list out really quickly the things you should do. Crediting, uh, prominently paying, uh, having very, uh, like, and talking to them like you would talk with anybody else. Um, the people who actually get to vote in the co-op are the people who are in the co-op. Um, when people are kind of onboarded, like, um, like Steve was saying, there's kind of like a probational period so that you can decide if you actually like each other enough to kind of enter into this kind of thing. But with contractors, um, you just do the best that you can and don't end up in a situation where you were relying on them to be the workforce for your co-op and, yeah. and stuff. So it's one of those things you have to keep yourself accountable on. Thanks. Oh, last question. <clears throat> All right, Sorry, cool. everyone else in line. Our, I think some Sorry. of us might hang out afterwards to <laughs> yeah, talk yeah. to. Yeah. So. All right, well, we'll keep this quick then. Uh, I'm MJ. I'm from Salt Lake City. I am a graduate student in games and production. What advice do you have for somebody who is a leftist who wants to enter the industry and wants to work under a co-op to get your foot in the door in this area that's more exclusive? Well, uh, as Scott said, there aren't that many places that are doing it yet. Um, but as somebody getting in the industry, I mean, uh, from, for my money, it would be kind of following what I've been saying, which is find other people to team up with. I mean, if you have a set of skills and you're entering as, as a freelancer, then maybe consider doing what we did and see if you can find other, other people with those skills who are equally looking and you've got double the power to, to do that. That's one way to approach it. Um, just jumping in to be part of a cooperative, I guess it's find a cooperative. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think uh, also like it is very, now is the time to get these things started. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to, like all of us came to these like differently, right? Like. Um, there's freelancers and gig economy workers. There's people whose studios transitioned into that. Um, there's, you know, Bethany and I, we had um, enough money to get a studio going, and so we decided to go with that thing. But off, oftentimes, like a lot of co ops, they don't start with everyone working full time together all the time, right? Like you can start something like this while you're all doing contract work or working with something like that and build it up. Like that's kind of what um, we did with Pixel Pushers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what we did as well. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just always like a off the <laughs> right off the blocks we founded a co-op and we're like running and stuff because there's uh, there's difficulties there's like you know you have to build up resources you have to see if you work together as a team you know you have to work yeah. out your like bylaws and all kinds of stuff um and actually go to the co-op uh, resource uh url uh up there for all kinds of information on on this kind of stuff um so i guess it would be kind of like just be flexible with it um, uh, and you know, maybe start something with some like like-minded folks, 
and kind of build it up into being the thing that you want it to be. Because it doesn't have to be your full-time job immediately, which is good because there's not many of them. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're just starting something, um, it might take a while to, to get it to the point where it's, you know, your life. <laughs> um, uh, and so, so that would be, I think, that's a big smattering of advice there. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, I think that's it. I think they're gonna kick us out. Mm.